Please be seated. I would like to begin with a word of thanks on today, my final Sunday with you here at St. James Cathedral. I have been living in Chicago near my daughter during this pandemic year and will be soon returning to my work in Jerusalem, the pandemic permitting that travel. I want to thank Dean Dominic, to the clergy staff, to the choir, to all of you. Thank you for your warm, warm welcome and for making this place a home for me during these unsettled times. I am most grateful. When I do get back to Jerusalem, I live about 50 feet away from the Cathedral Church of St. George, and I will remember you there in my prayers every single Sunday. North of Jerusalem is the modern town of Nablus, the largest city in the West Bank, but right in its center, surrounded by apartment blocks, is Shechem, or the ruins of the ancient Canaanite city of Shechem. Joshua, having led the Hebrew people into the Promised Land after the death of Moses, he is told to do two things by God. Get rid of all the Canaanites who happen to live in the land. Now, I do want to say that I fully understand that is politically really bad. But we have to deal with the text we're given. So, he's told to get rid of the inhabitants of the land so that the Hebrew people, people who've come up from Egypt can live there. And he's told to divide the land once it's conquered among the 12 tribes of the people. But he failed miserably, we should say, at the former. I'm an archaeologist, and although I don't work particularly in Old Testament periods, I do know that most archaeologists today don't buy the idea that the Canaanites just went away. We have centuries of evidence in the ground that the Hebrew people and the Canaanite people lived very close together. Those darn Canaanites, Joshua said, they were hard to get rid of. And settling the Hebrew tribes meant that they would likely come into contact with Canaanites, and we know they did. And some of them adopted Canaanite customs and, oh dear, Canaanite God. The book of Joshua begins with a speech and ends with a speech. God speaks at the beginning and tells them what they are to do in the land. And the book ends with its hero, the aged Joshua, giving another speech to the gathered people, the tribes and their leaders and their judges. He gathers them at a city sort of in the middle of the land, Shechem. And he says to them, choose this day whom you will serve. Remember the God who has brought you this far and has blessed you. Remember, now choose that God, our God, for you are entirely beholden to him for your very lives. Make a covenant with God to be God's people. Don't run after false gods, not the gods you worshipped, your ancestors worshipped when Abraham and his family were still beyond the Euphrates River. Don't worship them. Don't worship the gods of the Canaanite peoples or the surrounding nations 
We have a God who has brought us to this place. Choose this day whom you will serve. Very famous passage here, but it's a passage about a collective choosing. It's a people making a decision. Choose today, not tomorrow. Now is the time for our scattered tribes, now settled in their lands, to unify around one God. And when you go back home to your different tribal lands, when you disperse, take the covenant we make this day with you and worship the God of Israel there. No falling away. No leaving this teaching. No forgetting your promises. So, the Israelites, as the text said, responded to Joshua enthusiastically. We will serve the Lord. We also will do it, just like you and your family. Now, at this point, you might think that Joshua is going to say, that's terrific. Let's get on with it. I am really happy to hear you have made that decision. But in fact, that is not what he says in the text. He says, you cannot serve the Lord. God is jealous for your love. He's not going to forgive you endlessly without consequences. In other words, Joshua seems to say to them, I'm not entirely sure you've got it in you to keep this covenant. But the people respond, we will serve the Lord. And so the people confirm their covenant in a ritual act they write it down, perhaps the origin of the book of Judges itself. And perhaps they also did what was called cutting a covenant, sacrificing an animal, separating its body parts, and walking through those parts, symbolizing that may it be done to us as was done to this animal if we do not keep our part of the covenant. That's why in Hebrew one doesn't make a covenant, one cuts a covenant. The Hebrew scriptures contain so many stories of covenants. They are foundational to the biblical text. They're the constitutions, if you will, the covenant with Noah, with Moses, we know of them. It's a solemn agreement. I will be your God if you will be my people, and we will fulfill our promises to one another. Now, there was another Joshua. In Hebrew, the name is Yehoshua, shortened often to Yeshua, in English, Jesus. Did you know Jesus and Joshua were the same name? And that the word in Hebrew means, he shall save. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of the new covenant. He offered signs of the new covenant freely with his soul and his body broken for us. The new covenant was cut on the cross. His body is shared with us in Eucharist. For weeks, we have heard the words of John chapter 6, the so-called discourse of the bread of life. The writer of the Gospel of John goes to some length to speak about Jesus' body and blood and how we are united 
to him in a covenant of pure love. Now, do not underestimate how shocking the language John uses would have been for its readers and hearers. The Gospel of John is written in the later part of the first century, in a time when the emerging Church of Jesus followers and Judaism that is reforming itself after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It's written in that time when some conflict had come to be between the two groups. Scholars believe that John was being deliberately provocative when he unabashedly puts this language on the lips of Jesus, when Jesus speaks of the need for his disciples to eat his body and drink his blood. Indeed, those words have always made me just a little uneasy with their directness. The Jewish people recoiled at the idea of drinking blood, which was life force and belonged to God alone. Blood was drained from animals before they were eaten. Even the flesh of certain animals was forbidden. And here was a noted rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, of unimpeachable Jewish stock and learning, speaking of his followers, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Yes, it was shocking and provocative. But in these words, we come right to the very end of the Bread of Life discourse. And John goes right to the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It means being united with him, sharing in his own body, being made holy by his sacrifice, by the covenant which he cut. a covenant made eternal in his resurrection. This is the new covenant in my blood that is shared for you and for many. Now John doesn't shy away from telling us how all this talk was too much for many people who had followed Jesus. It was too provocative, too shocking, too difficult to understand, and the text tells us, and please hear the end of what was read this morning, because we can't leave it without seeing what the force of Jesus' words was. I'm quoting from John, because of this, meaning his teaching, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you, Dominic, do you also wish to go away? Do you want to fall away from my teaching, Brenda? How about you? Charlie or Lisa? You in the choir, would you like to fall away from my teaching? You, sitting here at worship, is this too hard for you? Or haven't you understood me? Or is this too provocative or shocking? This was difficult to hear and do. Joshua, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Jesus. He must have been heartbroken to see them slip away. Had he gone too far in telling people how much God loved them in the stark language of flesh and blood? Didn't they get it? I know with tears in his eyes, he turned to the twelve and asked them, are you going to leave me too? 
Has all my teaching fallen on deaf ears and misunderstanding hearts? I can see Jesus going around the circle of the twelve, almost shaking their shoulders, looking them directly in the eyes. Are you going to leave me? And he comes round to Peter, and yes, it must be Peter. Peter, the fisherman who had risen to leadership in the twelve, are you, Peter, going to leave me? And Peter utters the most true words. Lord, if we left you, to whom would we go? Who else is offering what you have given us? What other teacher has the words of eternal life? They got it. The new covenant in his blood was finally understood. His flesh was to be given for the life of the world. Yeshua, Jesus, he shall save. Eat this bread, drink this cup, to be taken up inside of him and to have him wrapped around us. He invites us in this Eucharistic sharing, in this faith, into the most intimate relationship possible, this sharing between us of body and blood. At our baptism, we enter this covenant of grace and we make our promises, and at each Eucharist we share in the bread of life, flesh given, blood poured for our life, covenant renewed in the intimacy of God's presence among us, and in these basic tokens of bread and wine made holy. By them, we are sanctified. The world is hurtling into a different place. The changes that all of us are experiencing are frightening. The rug is being pulled out from under us in so many ways that we wonder how we're going to stand up We're off balance, we're out of kilter. We're on the edge, water is scarce, heat is rising, weather is convulsing, peace is fleeting. Lord, to whom can we go? Yes, change is here and change is coming. And God, as ever, will be with us. For God keeps his promises, and we are called in these unchanging times to do two things. The first is, like the Israelite people, to remember the covenant that we have made in our baptism and which we renew week by week in the Holy Eucharist. Remember. And secondly, to live it in the full assurance that God is faithful. I want to leave us with one thought, and that is that the church is not our church. This is not our cathedral. It's not our Episcopal church, not our Christian community. The church is Christ's church. We are called to be members of it in this time, in this place, with the full assurance that there is none other to whom we can go to hear the promises of eternal life, but also 
to be sustained in these changing times. Do you wish to go away? Have these words become too difficult, too shocking, too hard? No, Lord. To whom else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen.